and welcome to a program which I think we're going to find fascinating here today to welcome Shelby Tisdale. Dr. Shelby Tisdale is retired as the director of the Center of Southwest Studies at Fort Lewis College in Durango, and she has over 40 years of combined museum experience in administration, exhibit curation, and tribal museum development. She has been the director at the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture in Santa Fe, the Millicent Rogers Museum in Taos, and has, was the vice president of curatorial and exhibitions at the Autry Museum of the American West in Los Angeles. She received her PhD in anthropology from the U of A and, uh, in 1997, and we're really fortunate that uh, Shelby has chosen Tucson to retire. Thank you so much, Diane, for that wonderful introduction. And I wanna welcome all of you who are here today in person, as well as all of you who are joining us by Zoom. Um, so I'm really excited to be back in Tucson and to be invited to come back to the Arizona State Museum and do this presentation. Um, this was a project that I worked on way back well, I wouldn't say way back, but in the early 2000s. Um, the book was published in 2006, and I worked on this while I was the director of the Millicent Rogers Museum. And we had funding to uh, do an exhibition of the museum's jewelry, as well as do a catalog. So today what I'm gonna talk about is primarily the jewelry that Millicent collected which is probably about two thirds of the collection. I'm not gonna be able to show all the pieces, but I'll show you just some select pieces. Um, and I would like to, before I get started, I would like to credit Addison Doty for doing all the photography of the jewelry pieces that I'm gonna be showing you today. Just, I wanna do that before I forget. So I'm gonna talk about Millicent in particular. I'm gonna give you a little history of her life how she became a collector, how she ended up in Taos, and um, a little bit about her, her life, which was quite extraordinary. Um, let's see, let me get this, there we go. Um, so Millicent Rogers, some of you might've heard of Standard Oil. Um, she was considered the Standard Oil heiress, and that unfortunately haunted her throughout her life. Um, even though um, she was considered to have a lot of money by anybody's standards, uh, it still impacted her in terms of, uh, you know, the people that she would be surrounded with and, and also people who would pursue her to be, you know, friends or whatever. Um, and it wasn't so much about her as much as it was about her money. She was born Mary Millicent Rogers, and she was born in 1902. And of course, this was just after the turn of the century. She was the granddaughter of Henry Huddleston Rogers, who was a very powerful New York financier. But he was also the mastermind behind U.S. Steel and Anaconda um, Copper. And he was well known throughout um, the New, New York and high society is the hellhound, hellhound of Wall Street. Um, Rogers um, became also a partner with um, J.D. Rockefeller and in Standard Oil, and that's where the Standard Oil heiress term comes from. It was in this particular environment, this very elite environment that, that Millicent grew up. She grew up in New York City as well as a beach house on the uh, in the Southamptons. This beach house actually was literally a Medici house that was brought over from Italy, brick by brick, and rebuilt in the Southamptons. Um, unfortunately, it was destroyed during a 1938 um, hurricane. But if you can imagine having that much money to take apart a home of the Medici and bring it over to the United States and rebuild it. It's pretty amazing. Her parents were Mary Benjamin and Colonel Henry Huddleston Rogers II. And um, this was a couple um, that was very prominent socially, 
in New York, as well as in Europe. They were well known by kings and queens in Europe and, and the wealthy in Europe as well. And they traveled back and forth a lot between the US and Europe. And of course, Millicent had, they had two children, Millicent and then her brother, Henry. And of course the kids would go back and forth with them as they traveled as well. So you can imagine Millicent was really highly educated in terms of the arts and so on. In, in Europe, they would go to museums all the time. And she was, she was very well educated in terms of the art world. She inherited the quick and driving energy of her grandfather, um, but also her mother was very artistic and she inherited that kind of artistic kind of um, personality of her mother and that sensitivity that went along with it. During her childhood, when she was eight years old, she had rheumatic fever. And this, um, because of the rheumatic fever, she ended up with an enlarged heart. And throughout her childhood, she had a number of heart attacks and she would be bedridden. So she really didn't have a lot of, of um, contact, you would say, with a lot of girls her age. So she, she stayed at home a lot and she was bedridden a lot. And during that time, she read books that she would find in her grandfather's library. And she would read books about the ancient peoples of the Americas, like the Incas, and then she would learn about Greece and, and the Romans. But she also, during this time, she learned to speak a number of different languages and actually read books in those languages. I mean, she became very enamored with different cultures around the world that she read about and the histories. She also was very creative. She already, as a child, she started drawing a lot. She started creating different fashion clothes, clothing designs. And she would, when she would go to, <clears throat> for example, like a debutante ball, she would get a gown by maybe a, uh, let me see if I can get this correct. Is it the middle? No, it's the, no. One of these, it's the middle one that's the little. Oh, the top. Oh, there we go. So take, for example, this dress here that she's wearing, getting ready to go to a debutante ball, would have been created by one of the latest couturiers of the time period in New York City. She would get it, take it home, take it all apart and redo it in her own kind of creation. This drove these designers crazy. Can you imagine somebody at the Emmys or the, you know, the Oscars taking a Valentino dress and kind of taking it all apart and creating it themselves? It would be pretty uh, scandalous, but she tended to do that a lot. And as I said, they traveled a lot between the US and Europe. When she was in her early twenties, she went to Europe and um, she met this, um, this prince, De Acosta, who was the prince of a king in Italy. And they became very much in love and they, they wanted to get married, but um, her father in the US forbade it, would not allow it. And also Mussolini at the time in Italy would not allow it either because she was not considered a high enough in the hierarchy to be marrying a prince. So that particular um, engagement got squashed. And it was, it was interesting because at the time she was really, really in love with this young man. She went off to another part of Europe and she met this older man and um, his, he was a count, he was an Austrian count. And um, in kind of retaliation, she married this count who was considerably older. He was quite the sportsman. He was very much known as a womanizer. They got secretly married in 1924 in New York and about three days later took off and went back to Europe. Within a couple of months, she re realized she had made a really bad mistake. Um, he was continuing to be a womanizer. Um, and you can imagine she wanted to be the one and only. And 
that did, so it didn't sit well with her. And also um, it turned out he had no money and he basically married her for her money. And at the same time, her father, who was very smart, cut her, um, her monthly stipend off, her allowance to hardly anything. So they would just have a minimum of, of living standard. And um, this didn't sit well with the count because he expected to get money out of this. So um, she found she was pregnant. So she came back to the United States after about three months of this marriage. She had her first baby. Uh, his name is Peter, Peter Selm. And he, um, and, and so what happened was finally her father had to pay off the count to get a divorce. So they finally got a divorce in 1927. And at about a month after the divorce was finalized, she married um, an Argentine aristocrat sportsman who's by, whose name is Arturo Peralta Ramos. She had two children by Arturo, Arturo II, as well as Paul. And what was interesting is she had had three, three sons and she was told early on not to have any children because of her heart, that with this enlarged heart, she would not be able to really be able to go through the childbearing, you know, childbearing and everything else. But she managed to do it. She had the three boys. Well, this marriage lasted quite a while. She had known Arturo for a number of years. So it wasn't like this just kind of came out of the blue. So they were married for a, a number of years. They finally got a divorce. And in 1936, she married a, this poor stockbroker who I think, um, Ronald Bush Bascom, I don't think he had any idea what he was getting himself into when he married, um, married Millicent. But about a month after they were married, she took off and went back to Europe. And he stayed in New York. And um, they stayed married for, for a number of years. And then finally in 1941, they did get a divorce. At that point in time, she decided to change her name uh, to Mary Huddleston Rogers and, or Millicent Huddleston Rogers. And um, that was stuck for the rest of her life. As I said, she had three sons. And this is a photo of her with her two sons before World War II. They were back in Austria, both boys. Um, let's see. No, it's this one. This is Paul, the youngest. And then this is, of course, Arturo, who's the middle, uh, middle son. I don't have a photo of Peter, but these two boys, because Peter by then was old enough, he just stayed in the States. These two younger boys went with her back to Austria, and they were sent to boarding schools in Switzerland. And it was during a time, this is taken about 1937, and she, she was starting to get a little nervous when, when Germany appropriated Austria, kind of getting a little nervous of what was going on in Germany with Hitler. And, things, and so things started to happen in the, in the early 40s, and she decided it was time to get the, her sons out of school and get them back to the US because things were starting to get a little shaky. It was also during this time that she found that a lot of her Jewish friends were in danger. And so she helped, she used a lot of her money to help her Jewish friends move to the United States to immigrate. So she lived in the United States for a number of years and then in 1947, she decided to go, um, or in early, excuse me, in the mid 1940s, decided to go to, to Hollywood. She needed a change. She'd been out on the East Coast. She also had been going back and forth to a home that she had in Jamaica. She was having affairs with all kinds of men, Ian Fleming, Raul Dahl. I mean, the list just goes on and on and on. And, um, you know, never found anybody. She, she, she basically had decided she was never going to get married again. So she, she would just have these flings, and uh, some of them, some of the flings would be in Montego Bay in Jamaica, like with Ian Fleming, or you know, up in the East Coast in Virginia, and um, at her, her, um, her mansion there. 
And she just, she was getting tired of it. And she said, I need a change. So she went to Hollywood at the invitation of uh, some of her Hollywood friends. She had friends with Gary Hooper and his wife, Rocky, uh, Gloria Gaynor, uh, who is a well-known actress and her husband, a uh, Gilbert Adrian. And Gilbert Adrian was a fashion designer, somebody she had already known from her uh, contacts with fashion in New York. Um, he was the one who designed most of the costumes for The Wizard of Oz. So she went to she went to Hollywood. She um, stayed uh, her fir the first year she was there. She stayed in Valentino's house. She rented <laughs> Valentino's house. Then um, and she was having um, she was having a, a what she thought was a really good relationship with Clark Gable. She fell madly in love with Clark Gable. I mean, really madly in love with him. But um, they had a breakup and she was really hurt by this breakup, very, very upset and disappointed. And so Gloria Gaynor and her husband, Gilbert Adrian, uh, were heading to, to New Mexico and they invited her to join them. So she did, she joined them. She went to New Mexico with them. Uh, they stayed in a little ranch uh, north of Pewaukee and then um, and spent a lot of time around the Santa Fe area. She met a lot of Native American artists. And then one day they decided to go up to take a, a little trip up to Taos and check out Taos. She went up to Taos with them and was just immediately enamored with Taos as so many other wealthy women were enamored with Taos. Taos. You just have to look at Mabel Dodge Lujan, for example. Um, and of course, the artists that were that were attracted and authors who were attracted to Taos, um, it just it, it was a whole new world to her. And she decided. This, you know, this is where I need to be. This is where my spirit needs to be. This is where I need to be. So just before they left Hollywood, uh, this photo was taken of Millicent wearing one of Gilbert Adrian's uh, designs. I just think this is the most gorgeous dress in the world. It's just beautiful. And she's still, I mean, she's still in her early 40s. She's still, you know, she's young. She's beautiful. She's still modeling. She goes back and forth between uh, New York and, and the West, wherever she's living. She's still working with all of these fashion designers, um, in, in particular like Chanel and Ch Mambouche, Chaparelli. And, and of course with Adrian. When she, um, when she, at one point after she passed her way, her, her sons donated over 600 of her uh, fashion garments to the Brooklyn Museum of Art. So they have huge collection of her fashion there. So she, she decided to stay in Taos. She just said, I'm staying. And so she moved, Moved, physically moved there in 1947. Um, as I said, she was introduced to this new world and she also went out to a lot of the Pueblos when, when they were in Santa Fe and started collecting Indian art, the jewelry, pottery, baskets and so on. And I love this photo because she is the first place that she rented when she uh, was waiting for her hacienda to be remodeled and, and added on to is Tony Lujan's house. And Tony Lujan was from Taos Pueblo and was married to Mabel Dodge Lujan. And so this is the house she's wearing. I can't believe she's wearing this outfit. She's got on a, a Charles James blouse, velvet blouse that they designed together. And then um, a skirt that was very much in fashion at that time were the multi-layer skirts, very much like they still are in, in the Santa Fe Taos area. So she's, she's she, and she's dying a piece of cloth. I mean, there's some sort of, you know, this is such a big change in her life. She's doing things that she's never done before. Um, and I love the fact that she, she collaborated with Charles James on these velvet tops. Um, they're kind of adapted from a Navajo velvet uh, blouse, but they're they're very different. They're they're very stylized, 
And they have a, a number of these in the collections at the Millicent Rogers Museum. And when you pull them out, they look like they were fit like a six-year-old. I mean, she was so tiny and so thin. And I mean, they're just, they're, they're so small, you know? <laughs> I mean, when I look at them, they're like, looks like it would fit on a child. But, um, but she was, she was very, very tiny. And she just, and part of it was just because of her constant illness. So this is just an interior shot of, of what Millicent's Tao's home looked like. This was, her home was called Turtle Walk. And she, um, she decorated the whole house, of course, with, with her collection. She loved textiles. She loved baskets. She also was a collector of, um, of Hispano uh, devotional or religious art. And so she had a lot of santos and, and retablos around the house. So now some of the jewelry. This is why we're here today. So one of the things she loved Native American jewelry. She couldn't get enough. I mean, she had a large collection of antique jewelry that she had picked up in Europe, as well as in New York. She had uh, creations that were done by famous artists in New York. But when she got to the Southwest, this was what really just intrigued her more than anything was the work of the Native American artists. And these are these are literally some of the pieces that she collected and that were then uh, donated to the museum when the museum was put together in 1956. I love this. I just love this one piece on the left hand side. I mean, this is a 31 strand coral necklace. It's just absolutely beautiful. And when you think of coral today, um, you probably couldn't make a necklace like this because you wouldn't be able to get enough coral to do it probably, or it'd be extremely expensive. Most of these pieces that I'm going to show you today date from about the 1930s, 40s. Uh, there are some pieces that date to the late 1800s, early 1900s, but she was, she was there at a time when uh, some of the older pieces could still be collected. And she also was very concerned about um, the Native Americans that she was coming into contact with, especially at Taos Pueblo, because she would see their need. Uh, she saw a lot, of, a lot of hungry people, for example, at Taos Pueblo. So she would arrange to have food taken out to people. She would, she would take money out to people so they could buy food. I mean, she just, she had this passion for, for the Native peoples that she was meeting. And I think because of that, she she really formed a great relationship with them. Also, one of the things that Millicent um, did, she she um, joined an organization that helped uh, Native Americans get citizenship, even though they had citizenship in 1924. In the late 40s, because of the Allotment Act, a lot of them were losing their land. And, and there was that whole push towards assimilation. So what she was able to do was with this organization was to go to Washington DC with a group of Native Americans to, to see about getting their citizenship more solidified. So she did a lot of that kind of work as well. Um, this necklace on the right-hand side, I love this necklace. This is by Likia that you see from Zuni. It's a big tab necklace. This necklace weighs over four pounds. And uh, Paul told me a story one time. He said, you know, I remember when my mom wore this out to, well, he, he wouldn't say mom, he would say MR. They both, all three sons actually called her MR. They never called her mom or mother. Um, he said, MR went to this party and she came home and she was complaining that her neck hurt so much. And, and they realized it was because this necklace was so heavy. And it is, it's, it's, a, it's a big, heavy, heavy necklace, but it's, it's absolutely gorgeous. I don't know of another one like it anywhere. And I mean, I've seen a lot of Likia's work, but nothing of this kind of uh, capacity. 
She liked to also collect things that were not necessarily um, just from the Pueblos. Um, the brass necklace on the on the left hand side, uh, for example, uh, was not collected by her. This was donated by someone else. But the the one in the center and the one on the right were made with trade beads. Uh, the crosses were made by Pueblo artisans, but I think these are these are amazing. And of course, she was able to get these date to about the 1900s, early 1900s, and so she was able to acquire some of these at a, at that time. And of course, she loved big turquoise. Sometimes you'll see photos of her wearing um, turquoise, uh, especially these rings that had these big cabochon in them, for example. Um, but I love this, this, um, this large turquoise settings that you see in these two pieces. And the one on the right hand side is, is just a lovely uh, pin that was made by Leo Poblano from Zuni. And of course, Navajo belts, you're gonna, you're gonna see one of the belts here today. Um, these are, these are great examples of some of the belts that were made that first 30 years or so of, of the century, of the 19, uh, 20th century. And I love these because these are good examples of kind of the closed um, silver concha that started to be made um, uh, with the stamp work and the reposé and so on. And then the other thing she, she collected a lot of were these Cato or Bogards and of course, the Catos were used um, to guard uh, the wrist when uh, when you uh, shoot off your arrows. And of course, today and, and even at that time, they were worn more by men during uh, ceremonies or for special occasions. And these have a nice range of different types of uh, silversmithing with the with the cast work, with the stamp work, with the reposé, with the um, you know, this, the uh, settings of the cabochons and so on and so forth. I love it because it just shows just such a great variety of what she collected. The other thing, of course, were bracelets. She had a lot of bracelets. And, um, and again, these are just, these are some of the early ones um, from the, the one on the left, this one, let's see. Yeah, this one right here dates to about 1900. And then these other two date to more like the 1940s. And then of course, one of the things I really love are these twisted wire bracelets. And we've got some great examples of these on the table for you to look at. And, um, and these are, to me, they're really beautiful because they're the, the different, it shows all these different techniques. And these, some of these with the, um, you know, these very large settings of these turquoise, boy, you can't find turquoise like this anymore today. And then of course with the Zuni, um, the Zuni learned to do uh, this kind of silver work from the Navajo. And so sometimes when you're looking at some of this early Zuni work, it's, it's almost Navajo-like, but it's not. And sometimes you're kind of going back and forth. Is it Navajo? Is it, is it Zuni? And, um, and I think the, these are wonderful examples of, of some of the cluster work that you see in, in this, this type of bracelet. Look at that, isn't that gorgeous? And these, it's kind of interesting. This one, it, the cat, the settings for these cabochons are almost, almost rustic looking. And then of course, some of the, um, the other type of cluster work that you see, this is probably, um, this is probably something a little more familiar when you think of Zuni. Uh, work with these with this cluster work, but also you have this Chanel inlay that that's very uh, much a signature signature type of work that that you find with the Zuni. Back to bracelets again. She loved her bracelets. There are a 
tons of bracelets in this particular collection. And this again, like the Kato's, to show you totally a variety of different types of, of work, silversmithing, the, the stamp work, the, the repose, the different kinds of uh, bands that are put together. For example, uh, this, this is a beautiful one. She wore this a lot. Um, she, this was one of her favorite pieces. She wore pretty much five or six bracelets on each, on each arm. And there's a reason for that after she started buying these bracelets. She felt like because of her heart that, you know, by having some weight on her arms would constantly be strengthening the muscles around her heart. Was that true? I don't know. I'll have to ask my cardiologist. I don't know if that's something that would work or not, but but she seemed to think that was that was that would work. That was her rationale. And of course, this is great because you do get to see her with all these bracelets. And she was known for mixing and matching jewelry as well as fashion. She was a real trendsetter in that respect. And so, for example, in this particular photo, she's wearing a Charles James blouse. She's wearing her, her bracelets. And I've got a couple of examples. These are some of the bracelets that she's actually wearing right here. And then this necklace, which is from Mexico, is the necklace she's wearing. You can just barely see the crosses down here. It's really hard to see. But on top of that, she's wearing this diamond brooch that's an antique brooch from Russia. So she just kind of would take things, mix them up, you know, just, I, I she was a trendsetter in that respect. I mean, now I think we don't think a lot of that, you know, we do, we just, do it but this was this was really her signature and what she was known for and I don't know if you can see them in this photo or not but she's wearing pearl earrings and in every photo you see of her she's wearing pearl earrings these were her grandmother's earrings and she wore them all the time and I think they're still in the family um so She also, as a young girl, I, I mentioned that she did a lot of sketches. She, one of the things she did is she would tell her children stories. And then she would make, she would make drawings of the different characters in these stories that she would talk about. And if you get a chance to go to the Millicent Rogers Museum, there is a room there. When I was director, Paul brought me a series of those drawings that she had done and he donated them to the museum and we created a room that tells one of those those stories with all of those drawings and it, it's really special but she loved to, you know I, I think I mentioned she liked to draw fashions well she also liked to design jewelry and so these when we um, found these different uh, sketches in the archives at the Millicent Rogers Museum um, Federico Jimenez, who's a, who's a, uh, silver artist was on the board of the Millicent Rogers at the time and said, you know, we could recreate these and, and sell them in the store. And so, um, the board gave permission for Federico to take the designs to his brother, Juan, who lived in, at the time was living in Tashco in Mexico. And they took the designs and they recreated them. This is one of them. This this is one that was sold in the in the museum shop when I was when I was at the Millicent Rogers, and we had a local artist, Larry Martinez, who was making these uh, a couple of the designs for us uh, mm -hmm. that we could sell in the shop. So we licensed them with him. So these are some of the designs that you see her, her designs were very much, as I said, influenced by, you know, the ancient Americas, um, ancient Africa. You could see like something, um, let's see, for example, like this one here, you could just almost see it's got kind of a Zulu kind of 
influence from Africa. This piece, of course, right here, which is the one I have on, this is what she called a Geronimo cross. And so some of that was influenced by, by her experience in, in the Southwest. But she also was inspired by nature as well as the stars. And uh, so there's this whole series um, of, of different um, stars, different uh, kind of constellations that, that she liked to, to kind of adapt to her designs. She was also um, inspired by mythological creatures. These guys are almost, oops, keep wanting to do that. This is almost like Picasso-like. In, in the way they they look. And then of course you've got the the mountains um and and different clouds and things like that that are some of her her designs. So it's fun to see these actually recreated from the from the uh, from the sketches. She also learned how to uh, make jewelry out of gold. She actually learned how to make her own jewelry and she actually had a uh, room set up, uh, added on next to her bedroom uh, at, at Turtle Walk, her, her hacienda in Taos, where she actually had it set up so she could make gold jewelry. She liked to make big, bold gold jewelry. And she made this ring and these cufflinks for the um, for Mambouche, who is one of her uh, designers from France that she really loved. And this is great because this has her signature right here in the date 1946 when she made it. And she learned to, to do the goldsmithing from Jacob Fried, Jacob Fried, excuse me, who was a famous goldsmith in, in New York. And he took the time to actually teach her metallurgy and, and how to, to make the forms and all of that to make her jewelry. And then, of course, this great photo of her, um, this would have been probably about, well, it was 1948, so it was while she was starting to make her gold jewelry. She's got this great big clunky necklace that's all out of gold here, but and you can't quite see it that well, but there's a little, there's a little bird right there. It's a gold bird. And that was a, a piece of Incan gold that she somehow acquired during one of her travels. And of course, the signature bracelets. And a beautiful Charles James gown, very, very, very sophisticated, very simple gown. But you can imagine if this was in color, you know, the gold around her neck. She's wearing those pearl earrings. Look, yeah, she's got those pearl earrings on and those necklaces or those bracelets. So I think this is this is such a signature towards the end of her life of what the what she was doing and what she was inspired by. And I think the Millicent Rogers Museum is so fortunate to have had this huge collection of her work there. Uh, we do have the gold ring, the gold ring and the and then um, nugget uh, uh, cufflinks are at the at the museum. We don't have some things like the gold necklace. I'm not sure that might have gone to the Brooklyn Museum of Art along with her all of her fashions. She passed away on New Year's Day in 1953. She was one month shy of turning 51. One month shy. She was just 50 years old when she passed away. And what happened was um, she had had a series of strokes and heart, and she was having these heart attacks and strokes all going on at the same time, right after Christmas. And they took her to a hospital in Albuquerque, and it was on New Year's Day that she had suffered a, a um, another stroke during some surgery that, that that she never came out of. And her last public appearance was on Christmas Day at. House Pueblo. She went out for the deer dance. And I don't know if you've ever seen a deer dance at, at House Pueblo, but it's it is it, it is really a spiritual experience. It's different than the, the deer dancers you see in the other Pueblos. 
Um, and when she passed away, it was very interesting because she was she was dressed in her one of her velvet blouses, her one of her multi-layered skirts, her moccasins that she wore a lot. Um, she was wrapped in a blanket and put in her casket and buried in in the cemetery at Taos, very small little cemetery. When Paul passed away, I Paul passed away while I was still director at the uh, at the Millicent Rogers Museum. He was buried next to his mother in Taos, and it was kind of it was so interesting because I guess her mother came out on a train and was just appalled. You know, here she is, this, you know, elite New York, sophisticated woman coming out and her daughter is like, what are you doing? You know, <laughs> what are you thinking? But for Millicent, her time in Taos was, was a real spiritual time for her. I really, it was a very special place and um, and her relationship with with the people out at the Pueblo was so enriching for her. And, and of course, when she was buried, um, a number of people from the Pueblo came to her her burial to pay her respect. And so I think she she was one who really lived her life to the fullest because of the rheumatic fever. I think she felt like any day I could just be gone. And so she she experimented with everything. She tried to experience everything she could experience around her. And, and I think her last years in, in Taos were really special for her. We've always wondered what, if she hadn't survived, if she hadn't passed away in Taos, what, where would she have gone next? But I think for her and what I've been able to read, um, and understand from both her sons was this was really, really the place. And both her sons had had homes in Taos. They would come and visit and stay for months at a time. And of course, when she passed away, her youngest son, Paul, was the one who really put the, uh, the museum together with some local folks who really liked Millicent and wanted to make sure her collection stayed there and was well preserved. So there you are. Yes, we have some questions. Yes. Did she ever go actually to Africa? It seemed like she went to Paris. You know, she did go to Egypt, um, but I don't know how far into Africa she might have gone. But I do know she did take one trip to Egypt for sure. And did she travel? That I don't know. And. Right. Um, yeah, because I, I, she was certainly influenced by, um, I think, South American Switch, yeah. art, and especially like the Inca and so on. But whether she actually traveled down there, I'm not sure. I know she went to Jamaica a lot because she did have a home in Jamaica in Montego Bay, but that's a good question because I have in, in some of, the, there's another biography that Sherry Burns did um, that's just a biography. I just have a little biographical information in this book, <clears throat> but um, yeah, I, I read that biography years ago. I'll have to go back and see if she says anything about her going to Africa. I'm not sure, or to even South America. Yeah, good question. Yes. Did any of the sons continue collecting art? Oh, yes. Did it? Okay. So the question was, did her sons collect um, as, as Millicent did? Yes. Yes, they did. And I'm more familiar with their collections in Taos. Um, Arturo, after, after Millicent passed away, Arturo started living at the Hacienda. Um, Paul built his own, own home. And um, and both of them, after after they donated so much of Millicent's collection to the museum, <clears throat> Arturo did start. He was collecting as well to furnish to furnish the hacienda, but also Paul. Paul 
collected mostly, I would say, um, Hispano art. He did have some pottery. He did have some some baskets and some textiles, but his main interest was was the Hispano culture, and that I would say his house was an it was like a museum with all the retablos and the and the bultos and everything that he had collected. And he was he was also able to collect really really old pieces from old churches and things like that. But yeah, they were both very much collectors. I did visit Paul's uh, apartment in New York uh, when I was doing research on this book. And um, his apartment in New York was so different. It was it was more artwork um, and especially European artwork. I have a question from Zoomland. OK. OK. Um, I'm curious how turquoise is shaped to fit into jewelry. Oh, the question is how they're curious about how turquoise is shaped to fit into jewelry. Well, it is, um, that's a good question. It's, it's basically carved like any stone. I mean, a lot of stones will come already polished and ready to be put into some sort of a setting. And for others, they might be, it might be a large piece of turquoise that they have to break into smaller pieces and then polish and and carve to to fit particular um, setting. Um, but that's you know it kind of, turquoise comes in many different colors, many different sizes, and you know if you go to like the gem and mineral show, you'll probably see vendors who already have uh, pieces that are already cut, uh, ready to be. Put into settings and it's the same thing with coral um, coral has to be uh, pretty much machine today it's done by machine back in the old days they would have fused i mean really ancient days i'm talking about you know kind of prehistoric pre-contact time period they would have been using sandstone to to try to rub down the stones to to make their jewelry because that the thing is, this jewelry um, goes back thousands of years. It's not something that's just been invented. It's the silversmithing that that the Spanish brought that's all new. Have they figured out where the red coral comes from? Ah, have they figured out where the red coral comes from? Well, um, interestingly enough, um, the red, really, really red coral comes from an area just out, uh, well, comes from the, the coral reefs uh, it, from uh, along the coast of Italy around the Naples area. And that was, uh, a, and the coral came to Zuni, and Zuni in particular really liked coral uh, early on. And um, there are, there's correspondence between um, this Torre de Greco, which is right at the uh, foot of Mount Vesuvius, um, where these were coral traders that lived there. And there's correspondence between them and, and uh, a trader at Zuni. And um, I know this because I've been to that, I've been to that area and I've been to the uh, one of the major coral traders there. And they were the ones who showed me the correspondence with, with the folks at Zuni. And the, the big deal for Zuni was they wanted really dark red. They didn't want the lighter color of coral. They wanted that really dark blood red coral. So that's what they would get through the trader. Yeah. Do they use spondylus shells? Um, because very often that reddish color is spondylus or not. Yes, yes, yes. And the spondylus, uh, the question had to do with, um, did they use spondylus coral or spondylus shell as well? And yes, yes, they did. And that was traded up from Mexico. That would come up into the Southwest as a trade item. And the Pueblos in particular, uh, especially the Rio Grande Pueblos, really loved to work with spondylus. That was one of their favorite um, types of shell. And of course, they worked with other kinds of shell, olivella shell, and some other shell to make like their, um, 
their their necklaces and things like that. So shell was very popular and it was also very popular during pre-contact time as well and 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 traded both from the ocean, Pacific Ocean, as well as from up in Mex down in Mexico. Let's see a Cortez area. I have two from Zoomland. Uh, someone was pointing out that one of the pieces looked like a Peruvian tui, mm -hmm. so perhaps she's a South American. Yes. Yeah. 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 The question uh, had, or the comment had to do with the uh, the fact that one of her pieces looked like a what was it? An Peruvian tui. Peru Peruvian tuli. Tumi. Tumi. Yeah. Yeah. So I think you know a lot of these design ideas she got from books. Uh, as well. She was very well read and she, you know, especially as, as a young child, she was reading constantly and reading about all these different cultures and their material culture from all over the world. And so, um, yeah, it doesn't surprise me there'd be something um, because she was very much influenced by South American designs, especially uh, you see some of those early Inca designs as well. Is Turtle Walk still standing? Ah, is Turtle Walk still standing? Yes, the Hacienda is still standing. Um, it was on the market for a number of years and I believe it's been sold and I believe it might even be uh, VRBO at this point. Um, I think there is a small a small dwelling of a small house on the property that is being rented out as a VRBO. I think don't, don't quote me on it because I, I looked right before coming today to see, cause I knew it was for sale to see if it had been sold and apparently it was sold, but I don't know what the status is, but I did see little Millicent Rogers house is for rent through uh Airbnb or VRBO or something like that. So not quite sure what the status of that house is, but I think it's been sold. Yes. Yeah. Okay, another question? Yeah. She's been traveling a lot and had a very land quiet life in the early years. Once she got the power, she actually stay there, but did she go back and forth to the East Coast, to Europe, to other places? The question is once once you know she traveled a lot back and forth between the United States and Europe and and other places and once she arrived in Taos did she still continue to go back and forth she did yes when she arrived in Taos after she got settled into Taos she did go back and forth between Taos and New York in particular i'm not sure if she actually went over to Europe after that um that's a that's a good question uh, I'm not sure about that, but I know she did go back and forth to New York constantly, and she was still modeling. She was still working with all of these uh, couturiers, these fashion designers, and um, and so on. And also, she was doing after she after she moved to uh, to uh, to Taos, there were there was one exhibit that she actually worked on. Um, and I don't recall the details right now, but it uh, they had a wonderful exhibit at uh, at one of the at the Brooklyn Museum of Art, and then of course she worked with Charles James and some other designers on an exhibit that was at the Metropolitan Museum of Art that was all on fashion, that um, that was right I, I think it was right before she passed away that 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 had opened. But yeah, she I don't believe she was going to Europe anymore. I think she was going primarily just back and forth from New York to Taos. Yeah. Yes. Okay. We're going to look at some jewelry now. So Diane's pulled a couple of fantastic pieces. <laughs> so, so many of you know that we have a, a exhibit up for a few more months and it's down in our, our first floor and it's called Ancient Modern, and many of the pieces, our best, most interesting pieces of jewelry are in that exhibit. Well, we have many other things that did not make it in, and last week, Shelby came, and we had a lot of fun looking through our collections mm -hmm. and trying to see 
some pieces that might have been similar to some of the pieces you just saw in her program. And there's two major collections that I have here. One of them is uh, from the widow of a man named Pierre Leconte de Nui. And if any of you have been to special collections, you might have uh, noticed that there's a whole room devoted to him. He was a, a physicist, a biophysicist, and his, his archives are at special collections. And after he passed away, his widow donated a jewelry collection. Fascinating man that we'll hear more about at another time. But he was collecting in the 20s and 30s, maybe up to the early 40s. And so the time frame is sort of overlapping. So we picked a few pieces. And uh, this is one that, Shelby, you had talked about Zuni jewelry. Right. So this one, it's interesting because this one in particular kind of appealed to me because it's the, uh, you know, typical Zuni cluster type bracelet, early one, but it also has a lot of Navajo influence in it. And you can see that along the side uh, with these square, kind of square cabochons and and so on. And it's just, um, I, I love the, the cluster bracelets. I think they're just so pretty and beautiful turquoise in that one as well. And you had talked about braiding on. Right. So this is one of an example of uh, the twist, what we call twisted wire. And I really, lo I, I love it. It's got a double twisted wire through the center. And then it's got all these wires that are kind of interwoven to create uh, this wonderful almost wave pattern throughout the bracelet. And here's just a few other examples from that time period, very thick. And you can see here that, uh, well, actually there's one of the pieces of turquoise is broken. This turquoise was not stabilized. A lot of what you see today has been infused with some kind of, of uh, acrylic strengthener. But, uh, and, and this is not, if you look at the settings, the, the, uh, the um, it's not, it's very handmade. There's not a lot of finesse. And sometimes if you're looking at jewelry today, you'll see the uh, little circle of silver that holds the turquoise has uh, serrations on it, but these are just straight little rings that are used for this very uh, different color, but very not stabilized turquoise. I don't know if you have any other comments about this. The only comment I have on this one, uh, I'm not sure we have it too much on the others, but it's pretty, uh, you can see it on this one, is the stamp work. And, you know, when you go to, when you go to, for example, a, a silver worker, somebody, a Navajo silversmith who's working on a piece of jewelry, there will be hundreds of different stamps. I mean, just and and they're made out of old old nails and all kinds of things. And this is this is a nice one because it's it's got some of that old stamp work. It's just very simple, but it's really it's really sweet. And it just is a great example of of the stamp work. I did notice that you're talking about the bow guards of the Quitos. Mm -hmm. uh, whoops, go away. Um, th that this is a very similar example that you had. It's. This part of it is cast, so it's you have a piece of tufa or sandstone that you're carving, and then you're pouring the silver in, and then it's just a very simple but beautiful center turquoise. And this is also from this is all what I'm showing you from Pierre Leconte de Nuit's collection. And squash blossoms. Mm -hmm. What what did uh, what, what did Millicent have lots of squash blossoms? She had a couple of squash blossom necklaces. She didn't wear them. It's interesting. She just didn't wear them. She wore her own kind of thing. But she, um, at least I've never seen a photo of her wearing a squash blossom. But there are some squash blossoms in the collection that she collected. And, you know, the, the one thing about the squash blossom, squash blossom necklaces, of course, is you usually have this this pendant that's called a nausea, that's a Navajo term. And then you get these, these little pendants and, and you know, the argument are, is, are these, are these pomegranates? Um, are they something else? And, you know, it's, I think it's up for an, your own interpretation, honestly. And this is an example also from Le Conte de Nui of a Zuni. You can just see the 
contrast where there's a riot of cluster turquoise pieces. So th those are some of the highlights of Pierre Le Comte de Nui. I think we have in our collection, oh, I don't know, about a dozen examples of jewelry that we got from another wealthy New Englander whose name is uh, Mary Cabot Wheelwright. And I stole this image of Mary off mm -hmm. the internet. It's a, a portrait of her by a very famous artist, Frank Duvenek, as a young woman. So Mary Cabot, if anybody's ever heard of the Cabot family, uh, there was Henry Cabot Lodge. They were one of the very early wealthy New England families. And so she uh, came from that source, also left, came to New Mexico and, and sort of redefined uh, herself. And uh, she had a very close relationship with the Navajo Hostin Claw. Uh, from whom she learned a lot about traditional Navajo culture. And she founded a museum called the Museum of Navajo Ceremonial Art, which is now the Wheelwright Museum. She was, when she was first collecting, fortunately for the Arizona State Museum, she was collecting Navajo ceremonial art. Well, these weren't Navajo ceremonial art. So she was very generous in donating to other museums like the Arizona State Museum. I believe that Emil Howery was very good at... Um, reaching out to wealthy women because it was in his time that that uh, <laughs> that Mary Cabot Real White Wheelwright ended up donating her her uh, works. These are more in the 1940s, but this is another example of a squash blossom or a, a necklace, which we were just discussing that now more and more these are referred to as Navajo pearls. This doesn't have the pomegranate or squash blossoms, but it just has these lovely little have. So this is one of the necklaces, probably dating from around the turn of the last century that we got from her. This was actually on exhibit for a very long time, and it's one of my favorite pieces. It is a um, part of a belt, just a section, the silver part of a belt buckle, but it's made from a reworked Santa Fe Railroad um, metal tab. And so here you there's you might not be able to see it, but there's actually resident a uh, residual where you can read the stamping that this is the uh, Santa Fe Railroad reworked and uh, talk about amazing stamp work. There's just stamp work mm -hmm. to town here. Yeah. Oops. Goodbye. Um, hey, I'm gonna show one more, and this is from we we got that as as a donation in 1998, but it reminded me very much of one of the of the cuffs mm -hmm. that Millicent wore a lot, probably again, dates around 1900. And it has a distinctive kind of, of texturing on the side that's called swedging, where basically you're taking silver and you're pounding it into a, a some kind of piece of metal that has these ridges. And by the time you're pounding it, it creates that kind of pattern. Plus it's a very simple, lovely, centerpiece. And so this mm -hmm. is this is another of our cuffs that reminded me of what Millicent yeah, wore. Very much so. And can you hand me the just the, the last thing I'll share? Certainly there was a lot, Shelby referenced um, these kind of necklaces that have have he she have shell, have turquoise. And this is actually a pretty rare piece that we got as a gift from a man who had a I think a trading post around to the city. But these red things, these are, are trade beads. They're white hearts, they're called, because, well, they have white hearts. And it's pretty rare to have had a combination of the red that wouldn't have been coral. The, the trade beads would have been certainly much easier to get and a lot less expensive than the coral, but it's that love of that deep red color. And um, I would encourage all of you, if you're in the area, to go to see our exhibit, Ancient Modern, because we talk a lot about not only the, um, the fact that these are beautiful colors, the turquoise and the, the orange colors, but they have a lot of significance. This exhibit is available as well online. And so if anybody wants to know more about the significance of, of spondylus, the significance of turquoise into the, the cultural and spiritual side of the people in the Southwest, you can find a lot there. <laughs>